Good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, give you apologies from uh, the Dean Rodolfo El Curi, who is uh, the lecture. I think he's giving a lecture in Sarasota, uh, Florida, and cannot be with us tonight. And he just asked me to introduce our speaker, Shorei Shigemetsu, uh, tonight. Um, Shorei is right next to me, and after having been on uh, construction sites in Miami, as he will tell us, uh, he was born in Japan and graduated uh, in his degree from the university in uh, Tokyo before going to the Berlage Institute uh, in uh, Holland and get his master's degree there. He joined uh, OMA and the Rem firm uh, in 1998 and became a partner in 2008. He has led the office of OMA in New York since 2006. Uh, shows designs for cultural venues include the Quebec National Bozar Museum and the Faina Art Center here in construction in Miami Beach. If you have not seen it, it's worth going absolutely, as well as many other projects in collaboration with artists, including, for instance, Kai Guo, Kai Guo Zhang, Marina Abramovic, and Kanye West. His engagement with urban condition is also very important and uh, can be translated in many projects around the world. Uh, a civic center, a new civic center in Bogota, Colombia, a post-hurricane sandy urban water, urban waterfront strategy for New Jersey, uh, New York, and also in, uh, uh, in Miami. He's currently a design critic at uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Design, where he's conducting what seems to be a very interesting research studio entitled Alimentary Design, investigating the intersection of food, architecture, and urbanism. Now, Shaw's involvement in Miami uh, started, I believe, in 2012-2013 with the now uh, ill-fated project for the redevelopment of the Convention Center on Miami Beach, a project that was commissioned to uh, OMA, but eventually was canceled by the newly elected commission in Miami Beach, one part of the saga of that construction. At that occasion, though, he lectured for us uh, at the Lincoln Theater on uh, Lincoln Road, uh, a big uh, crowd, about five, six hundred people for that lecture with uh, Rem Kulhas in uh, presence as well. And I had the chance to introduce him and Rem uh, a first time. Then he was at the school a second time for the conference that was organized by the School of Architecture and the uh, Urban Studies program here on campus called Cities 2040. And he was uh, one of our keynote for that conference in 2014. So it is... Uh, my pleasure to introduce him for a third time, um, and it is no without further ado that I invite you to greet uh, Sir Aisha Gamitsu tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, yeah, it, it is actually third time, so um, maybe I didn't really think about that, and maybe I will be showing something that I already have shown. Um, I would like to start from um, um, my background and how my background actually relates to the kind of whole trajectory of uh, uh, my practice. Um, this is the GDP uh, gr growth or basically decline of Japan um, after the war. And you can see that the kind of steady decline uh, marked by the kind of three major kind of uh, um, uh, credit crisis. This is a superimposition of my life to that uh, graph. So basically my kind of key moments in my life actually coincided quite well with those uh, uh, economical crises. So I was in a kind of, uh, if I look back, I felt like I was doomed to live with a downturn because I'm the kind of second generation baby boomer in Japan where the um, the economy in my parents' uh, generation, the economy just went up after the war, but um, I'm the first generation that uh, basically the economy went down cons consistently. Um, speaking of the relationship of the economy to architecture design, this is uh, the design in Japan from 60s when, you know, econo economy and basically the um, uh, longing for the, uh, um, the modernization was quite high. So you can see the uh, sense of uh, gravity, sense of edge, sense of materiality, uh, it's all there. And also in, even including 
uh, proposing a system for architecture, but this is a, one of the mainstream architecture in Japan now that has no sense of edge, nor materiality, nor color, which a lot of people refer to this kind of uh, Japanese architecture nowadays as something very minimum and very Japanese. Uh, but I actually would uh, like to say that this is indeed maybe related to some part of Japanese culture, but I can also say that this is uh, a product of long-lasting recession. So since I was really interested in uh, downturn rather than the upturn, uh, I, did the class, I did the research at uh, Columbia and Harvard to really investigate the meaning of the uh, economical crisis. So when the economic index goes down like this, um, in, in short, the, the people's uh, feeling and connect, uh, uh, thinking actually goes up, uh, on the contrary. So, for example, the, the, big, the, the typology that gets built and modernization, which was relatively the kind of dominant uh, type of uh, economical model uh, in our parents' generation. But now we have uh, quite a, a variety uh, of conditions that modernization might happen during the downturn or the demodernization has to happen in the uh, upturn economy. So, it's the, the world is, uh, as an architect, becoming, uh, you can say, more interesting or uh, quite complex. For example, um, this is the showing the GDP growth, uh, but the color actually represents the, uh, whether it's a dictatorship or it's a democracy. So the, uh, the blue is democracy, red is uh, dictatorship and irony is that uh, the more economical growth is obviously happening in a country with dictatorship. So as an architect operating internationally, you have to work in a condition or in a society where you can't even share the core values such as uh, human rights. But that, that doesn't prevent us from working there, uh, but we always have to deliver something that improves that particular society. So for me, uh, as, a, as a Japanese uh, architect who didn't really experience a true modernization in Japan, it was very important for me to really be in China, for example, and really feel the modernization um, uh, in, and immer immersed into the, the, that kind of atmosphere. So th this is CCTV headquarters. It is the second biggest uh, office building in the world uh, after Pentagon, which I led the competition to win and also worked until end of the D phase. Uh, this is quite a complex building with uh, multiple functions from studio to uh, office space to uh, um, yeah, many kind of very complex TV making um, program. We basically put uh, all the program into a single loop so that it uh, represents symbolically the TV making, which never stops. Uh, also, we thought that uh, by connecting all the departments that tend to be separate and create certain uh, obstacle for creative process, we, uh, we thought by making an actual physical connection would benefit to have a smooth communication. Also, by cantilevering, we basically liberated the park uh, underneath uh, the cantilever for the public. I just show you this because, as I showed you earlier in the diagram, in China, for example, the modernization and uh, the preservation is happening at the same time, which, uh, of course, uh, until now, that kind of simultaneous uh, happen, uh, it didn't really uh, happen simultaneously. So this is like a futon or even like communist era 
uh, housings that are now being considered uh, to preserve. Um, and then I was working on in Chinese project for from maybe early 2000 to mid 2000, um, and then a little got a little bit tired of just being always uh, chasing the kind of booming countries. So uh, I moved myself to North America and uh, started to uh, work on North American projects. So the projects I will show you today is basically a product of New York office, which. Since I took over, it already almost 10 years has passed, and these are some kind of, uh, well, the projects are finally kind of coming up, like this one. Um, this is a National um, Museum of Quebec, and this is the Quebec City, uh, which has a parallel existence between the park and the city uh, that is kind of, uh, um, you can see that the existing uh, museum uh, was always in the park, uh, but they acquired a site that faces the main avenue of the city. So they, uh, for the first time, get the, the address of the city. Um, I show you some studies of the project because uh, often when I present my, well, when I give a lecture, a lot of people say, oh, OMA is also so diagrammatic and also it's always very linear and very clear in kind of explaining the concept, but actually, of course, within, until you get to a kind of final concept that we uh, are convinced of, we do a lot of studies. So I show you the kind of the, the, the um, studies of this competition, which was an international competition, two stage, where like Biarke and uh, other people like Chipperfield and all, all the offices were in. Uh, so this is actually, of course, the studies that are not made for the lecture. It was made for our internal discussion. So you can see the level of uh, studies that we are doing to discuss things. Of course, just the basic massing. Uh, this one was to create a kind of wall, uh, almost like an ant farm of museum where you actually see uh, the kind of section of the art, uh, the collection. Um, uh, like a, like an iPad, um, and creating a huge wall. Uh, this was a, a two-tower scheme, so that to create a kind of internal courtyard with a preserved church and separate the uh, museum clearly into a gallery space and non-gallery space. So these were made for the internal communication. So, you know, you do a lot of studies and then by the time you get an internal consensus, we somehow manage to, of course, uh, that internal consensus could be, pre be uh, ready to be presented to a uh, uh, client immediately. So that's the kind of trick uh, that is happening in OMA that you uh, develop the communi communication skill uh, within the firm so that uh, uh, it's quite adaptable uh, in, the, in other occasions. Um, this was some kind of uh, celebrating the kind of skylight, so almost the building itself becoming the, um, this kind of natural light uh, uh, ceiling that is, of course, a very much a feature of museum nowadays. Um, this was an interesting uh, attempt to make the kind of entry to the park and also, uh, uh, so it's a wedge shape that uh, leads people into the park. So the, the, because it, this used to be the kind of main circulation to go into the park, but this will create a new entry, not just for the museum, but also to, for the people to go to the park which I, I liked it a lot, but obviously the triangular space is not some, such an ideal space for the um, art exhibition. So after all these studies, uh, we came to uh, um, a resolution. 
Um, we went back and thought that this site, of course, is at the edge of the park and the city, and uh, it's a extension. It's a museum extension project. Uh, so we thought that maybe not just the uh, museum will extend, but uh, both park and city uh, get to extend at the same time. So the three entities get an extension, and then the art becomes a catalyst between the park and the city. So it really represents the kind of ambition and the, the location of this uh, uh, new museum. So you can see the topography going up to the museum, and the gallery's boxes are basically a stack of uh, what they needed, permanent and temporary. This is almost done, it's gonna open in uh, June. So you can see, uh, again, a cantilever to this city, creating this big uh, entry hall facing the to the city. This entry hall is a column-free space because in Canada, the, it's not 100% privately fund, the museum, so they have to raise their own revenue. So the, actually, the, en the entr entrance hall is used as an event space. So we had to simulate like a, a, a wedding and so on, so that they can actually raise money through renting the space. So it's in a way interesting typology that the art is on top of an event space. And also they can rent the um, terraces. So this is a space in between the church, so you can see the old and new. Again, this is looking back to the church. So you have the, uh, here is the library, and this is a, a remaining prospectory. The circulation is justified on the uh, left side, uh, always uh, um, attached to a certain program like auditorium uh, and the signage space. So this is uh, the main atrium where you have uh, windows to frame the existing building. Uh, it's almost done. And this is the one moment that it has some organic move. Uh, the rest is quite uh, straightforward and boxy. Um, so I have been doing this kind of, of course, uh, traditional, uh, let's say, uh, um, institutional project. But uh, during the recession, like uh, around 2008 or 9, we happened to work with very strong individuals who uh, has uh, uh, certain new ideas that are not are abound to a kind of uh, um, typical um, thinking. So we would like to show you those because that kind of collaboration actually enhances our idea uh, of dealing with new typology, new, uh, de uh, making a new typology, which is always, as an architect, quite rewarding. Um, for example, Kanye West, uh, he kind of suddenly knocked our door and said, just said, uh, why is the cinema experience only with one screen and not multiple? So he wanted to develop uh, a film typology like IMAX with multiple uh, screens, and then he wanted to direct the film himself. So uh, we thought it was a great idea. Of course, some architects already had done those studies, but. Uh, we, we thought uh, him doing it with us would make something quite interesting. So we immediately went to uh, prototyping. I mean, this was one of the first model. It's quite crude, but... And then we immediately made a rig uh, of cameras because the idea was to also film with seven uh, cameras. We decided uh, quickly as seven screens, just seven sounds good, so uh, he wanted to use seven. Uh, and this is a final camera he used to film his uh, short film. Uh, we went, obviously, a lot of iterations, but this was the final dimensions of the screen, so you have sides and top and the bottom. Uh, we were also asked to design the first pavilion for this system, so we started to design the pavilion. For example, it could be like a uh, environment where the box, uh, mysterious box is placed, but actually this box opens and becomes seven screens. And then, or this kind of uh, slightly more formal uh, uh, object that uh, uh, has the screen and the seat, like this. Also, because it's Kanye, we thought we could actually sell these kind of products, like a, a Google. 
Uh, but quickly, uh, the, the site was decided. Uh, it was going to be uh, shown in the Cannes Film Festival. And the site, this is a typical uh, Cannes, the, the film uh, screening area, but our site was a little bit further out uh, next to an abandoned casino. Uh, because it was such a quick turnaround, we had to choose already the uh, um, uh, typology, uh, the, the temporary structure that is already approved by the French government. So the, the, um, the variety of shape was uh, limited. Uh, we chose the um, um, pyramid because Kanye started, well, had, had this kind of obsession to something kind of Egyptian or Asian. And also, of course, the, this kind of label uh, that he uh, worked with had uh, uh, this kind of sign um, during the concert. Everyone does this. So we thought it was interesting to do, use the um, um, pyramid. Um, we, we were also actually happy that we didn't really design the tent uh, from the scratch because during the Cannes Festival, as you know, this kind of tent uh, is everywhere in the city. And we thought it's actually quite nicer that, uh, much nicer that our, our pavilion is kind of disguised to be the same, but a little bit special. Uh, so what we did in short is to uh, use the, the existing tent structure, but cut, uh, uh, made four big beams to suspend and hem the pyramid so that it looks like it's a floating py pyramid. Uh, it's a tent also, but uh, it's a structure itself to hang all the necessary gears, like the um, um, screen, basically seven screens and um, projector and sound system. One another design feature we added was to add a red carpet into the space because we were we thought that uh, nowadays the red carpet is becoming even more important than the actual film screening. So. We thought that the uh, uh, red carpet should actually continue into the uh, space. We had to also make a kind of circulation analysis so that all the celebrities can uh, uh, arrive uh, and get a, uh, a photo, and then they can leave without being seen by paparazzi. So this was erected um, and uh, this is a pyramid that is kind of floating. And why it's floating is that uh, you can see, of course, it looks kind of mysterious. It's uh, Kanye and Kim. Um, that uh, when you're inside, basically, it frames the, uh, um, the coast uh, bay of uh, Cannes, which is quite beautiful, obviously. And at, during this time, there are a lot of really elaborate ships that are uh, owned by a lot of celebrities and billionaires parked in this bay, so you can actually uh, see those uh, landscapes and changes. Uh, so these are screens that are hung from the structure. And this is the um, seven screens. So you can see sometimes it captures the floor and the ceiling, sometimes it, uh, showed a uh, different speed. For example, in the top and the bottom has a, uh, a slow motion, but uh, the rest is a normal speed. He actually did a quite a good job on using seven screens in a variety of ways. So this was a kind of tent at the tip of the uh, peninsula. Um, I think uh, this Alain Faena uh, also is basically a part of um, this kind of powerful individual. Uh, you might not know him, but he actually changed the entire uh, port of Argentina by renovating an abandoned silo into a, a five-star hotel. Now that's the, one of the highest uh, uh, real estate in Buenos Aires. Uh, so he came with that uh, uh, expertise to Miami Beach and then uh, started to develop uh, the neighborhood. I mean, that's that's the key that he always develops a neighborhood, never uh, about one big compound like Fontainebleau. Um, so he bought this uh, Saxony hotel now being designed by uh, Buzz Lerman. This is a Norman Foster condominium, 
but our, our three buildings were across the Collins. As you know, it's a very hard street to cross, and also not beachside makes it immediately not so attractive. But we were, uh, uh, to, do, we were to design the, uh, basically the cultural component of the uh, whole development. Uh, first thing we thought is that, of course, this site was the biggest, where it was going to be the cultural center. Uh, this was an existing hotel that we had to preserve, and we, we needed a parking, so we had a mechanical, mechanical parking. But instead of one big uh, volume here and two smaller ones, we thought immediately that you can actually have four equal volumes. Uh, we also claimed uh, a center by making the round uh, shape here and providing more public space around the building and also has some kind of resonance to the arc of the Saxony uh, and uh, the round shape, which of course has some resonance to the Miami uh, modernism. So in, the, in, the, uh, in short, this is the building, basically a cube and a cylinder, a very basic shape that is attached as a one building that looks like two buildings. So the main space uh, has this kind of shape, uh, classical uh, round, uh, auditorium and the uh, contemporary black box that are attached could be used some, uh, as one big space. Uh, so section is also the difference is uh, enhanced by this uh, cylinder side being having a dome. So you can use this as a, a one big space. You can do uh, about uh, 800 people concert. Uh, or you can use two spaces uh, 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 simultaneously by different uh, events. So you can imagine that this kind of new type of art space is very necessary in uh, Miami Beach, but also in general that nowadays art is not just bound to uh, a visual art, but you have to cater performance art and a very different diverse range of art forms. This is the lobby where you can also do small events. So you, practically, you can actually do three events at, uh, simultaneously. Um, the arrival in Miami Beach uh, in the hotel, uh, the strip is quite elaborate. So we also wanted to have some, some kind of a strong arrival experience. But we didn't want to add the canopy to the building. So we basically cut the building and made a, a, a cantilever. So the building itself become a canopy and the landscape slides in. So this is the uh, covered exterior space where you arrive and there's a water feature and landscape around. Your, there's, above you, there's a building, and you go up to the uh, lobby, main lobby. In order to achieve that cantilever, we had to use the um, um, a facade as a structure. So this, is a mobile, this facade is basically mobilized as a structure. And you can see it's a series of arches that suspends uh, uh, that cantilever that is tied back to the ground here. And that's overlaid to the anti-hurricane measure, uh, this kind of uh, basically slightly smaller segments of windows uh, that are overlaid, and that became the, our facade. So that created uh, this kind of pattern. We liked it because it looks kind of organic and uh, uh, in a cheesy way, like a palm tree-like. So we thought it was interestingly matching uh, the, envi the environment of my beach. Uh, so this is the current situation. Uh, it's much further than this. I was just there. Basically, it's all exterior is more or less done, so it's all interior job now. This is basically seeing from the black box to the, um, the dome space. Uh, you can see here it's a mechanical parking where we expose uh, two car elevators so that you can actually see cars going up and down. Uh, as you know, Miami Beach is becoming the center of uh, Star Architects parking garage. So, um, but we are the only one which is delivering the mechanical parking. 
Um, I would like to share some kind of uh, cultural, uh, well, the observation that we, we've been uh, having in relation to the projects that we will show you. Um, it's this kind of uh, a creative city tendency. You know there are uh, 69 uh, creative cities in the world. Creative city is a category that UNESCO gives, and it, it's not just, well, there are many type of creativity like art or literature or music or gastronomy, etc. cetera. Uh, there are 69 creative cities. But you can see uh, that uh, they gave last year, or 2014, more than uh, 25 uh, countries, uh, cities. Uh, so you, you can see that it's kind of uh, strangely uh, have a, a exponential growth. Uh, I just projected uh, this kind of a growth rate uh, until 2025, and if you really calculate that, it becomes 751 creative cities. Uh, in that case, uh, you know, you can question what's, what, what creative means. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, this kind of thing happens because there is a certain cookie cutter textbook to become a cultural city or creative cities. Uh, as you know, like uh, uh, Lord Cultural Resource actually make a, a manual to become a um, um, cultural uh, cities. So a lot of cities can actually use these manuals to become uh, creative. I mean, for me, of course, uh, if you can be creative through manual, it's, it's great. But uh, of course, probably it's missing the point of uh, uh, true creativity. Um, this kind of homogenous world is also what I'm uh, trying to say uh, to uh, alert. Um, for example, I'm, I did the research at Columbia about the museum or art space. As you know, when Bilbao was made, uh, all the municipalities wanted to have the uh, same iconic museums. But now, that's, in my theory, it's dying. But instead, the art event is uh, become, replacing the museums. So like the, uh, the city is, of course, obvious the, the top forefront of that uh, um, um, tendency so that the Art Basel or Biennial and all those perennials are actually taking over the iconic museum. So there are uh, about 200 uh, biennials in the world and for example in a given month like September of 2013 there were uh, 22 biennials happening at the same time in, this, uh, in the world. So that means similar to the, the creative city tendency uh, you can imagine that a lot of biennials become very similar to each other, and the experience also becomes very uh, homogenous or predictable. Um, that's also happening in somehow architecture in a, in a single city level, this kind of flattening and losing the character. Uh, for example, this is a city of Tokyo, big enough to uh, have different districts represented by different colors. Uh, if I compare that situation to like a dinner table, it's more like an a la carte style, diverse range of dishes that you share with your family. But nowadays there are a lot of uh, um, prescribed um, um, a big commercial developments that are happening. These are two major ones that just happened in Tokyo that has all more or less exactly the same uh, um, type of program packaged, which we call it a bento box type of uh, development. So instead of a uh, um, very diverse experience that you share and uh, stimulate the conversation and so on, um, nowadays the experience in the city is a little bit more predictable like this kind of bento box. So no matter how you actually do uh, as an architect, to disguise this situation by using cool facade or cool shape or cool whatever, uh, the fundamental program is not changing. So that's, uh, of course, uh, an issue. So we are trying to be involved when we work with the developers to really think of the program itself. But also, uh, this is we still also get the uh, mixed-use project. So I want to show you a couple of projects that we have been doing. The first one is in Jersey City. 
Um, it's uh, across Manhattan. Ironically, the uh, renaissance of Jersey City came after uh, 911 happened when uh, financial district, a part of the financial district moved to the other side. Uh, the developer wanted us to do something like this, but we, of course, politely declined. But uh, we knew that uh, there is a very strong formula for the developers, as you know, to, of the dimensions. So until now, mixed-use, let's say, bento box uh, projects were created, used, put in different program in a hermetic tower, so a single shape, like a bento box. Uh, that was a kind of uh, the great point of the um, uh, mixed-use building. As Rem also said in uh, um, Delirious New York in the downtown athletic club section. But anyway, so we, but we thought that uh, maybe that's actually harming uh, a program within the mixed-use program because you always have certain inefficiency if you you know, uh, force a program to fit in a, a defined box. So instead, we actually came up with uh, the ideal volume and the layer for each program, and then basically stacked them on top of each other like the wooden block. So it's kind of a reverse thinking that each program has its own ideal volume, and by uh, 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 piling them on top of each other, it creates this kind of vertical public space throughout the uh, building. So it literally looks like you basically kind of took a generic uh, developer buildings and then uh, put them on top of each other. So the, the um, effect on the skyline is great. And also, of course, developer was uh, kind of happy that in each box, you almost have a perfect plan. Uh, but the premium they're paying is these uh, cantilevers. Um, so with this uh, method, uh, we are also doing a project in uh, Bra Brazil, in Sao Paulo. Uh, as you know, it's a ver very vertical city. The site was in L shape. Uh, also, the site was going to be the new uh, CBD, new downtown. Uh, we said that a lot of towers were planned. So we, we told the client, do you really want to do a typical development like this that will, of course, uh, be uh, subsumed by the other towers? So we said, OK, instead, maybe you can actually make a kind of uh, horizontal stack of different program, like a screen. Uh, and in the, uh, between different program, you have a, a sky lobby that has uh, some uh, openness, like this. Again, this is uh, an ideal uh, bars for each program. So you basically express that uh, need quite honestly in the section. Why we made a screen is also, uh, again, it was L-shaped site, but also this is a Walmart, and then this was the art school. So we thought that we should protect art students from Walmart. That was the um, kind of joke that we used. So you can see the kind of uh, uh, effect of the huge wall. So these are the uh, sky lobbies that has uh, some open floors. Um, also, it was interesting in engineering-wise because the site was constrained and the Walmart was already built uh, at the time. So we didn't have uh, enough site area to stage the construction. So we decided uh, with Arab to build uh, the cores first uh, and then start building from the top to bottom instead of the other way around. That will uh, shorten the construction time. Um, I also think that a lot of maybe what's the architect's ultimate goal or ultimate ego is the tallness uh, or wallness. For me, it's a little bit uh, the, uh, the latter, I think. A lot of architects, as you know, projected this kind of uh, utopian wall typologies. 
and unconsciously maybe certain developments are achieving that nowadays. Uh, so we got to learn that uh, the client actually acquired a site next to our site. So we decided to, uh, well, we recommended to uh, the client to continue the wall so that it becomes like a great wall of Sao Paulo. Um, then now we are doing also a project in LA, in Santa Monica. Uh, it's a city-owned land with this mixed uh, program. Um, and uh, the, we thought that the, because the climate is so uh, nice there that the, you can actually, you don't need air conditioning almost uh, half of the year. Uh, we thought that each program can have its own um, terrace or the exterior space so that it enhances the indoor out, outdoor living of Santa Monica. So this was a city owned land. If you really make one building with Civic Plaza, of course, one, only one program gets to interact with the plaza. But we thought that uh, you can unhinge them and make it into steps so that each program has its own uh, plaza in front of you. Also, by making this kind of step uh, shape, you can actually create uh, less shadows to uh, each terraces and each uh, bars. So this is the uh, design, has distinct gardens and terraces in, on top of each bars. Um, this was the uh, animation. Uh, I mean, Oma maybe is not so known as making this kind of flashy animations, but we actually do sometimes, so we just wanted to show you. Actually, there's a sound, which I forgot. Anyway. One interesting thing is that you see here culture, because the site is so mega, mega block, so it's so deep that the retail becomes a little bit obsolete towards the center. So we convinced the client to bring a cultural tenant in the center where it's completely hidden by the retail. Um, Interesting, uh, um, we do a lot of competitions and this actually Park Grove that we are doing is uh, one of the interesting story of the competition. Um, as you know, Coconut Grove uh, is one of the first settlements, so it has kind of uh, uh, its own culture and pride. This was the first grid. The site was actually at the junction of the edge of the grid and the, uh, uh, the coastline. You can see the site, the convention center is now gone and now it's, this, is, this area is going to be a park, a uh, sculpture park. Um, this was, we thought, one remaining last land to have a, a connection between the city and to the park and to the waterfront. Um, the model plan they uh, uh, asked us to design was basically two towers like this. This is Biarque's uh, twisting and this is Ritz Carton. Anyway, we thought there was a lot of fat, even like um, uh, Biarque's kind of fat towers that prevents the porosity of the, uh, between the city and the um, water, waterfront. So we decided not to uh, do these two towers, but to make six towers out of two towers. So to introduce the slenderness as if the, uh, well, it's stacked villas. Uh, it has some uh, view corridor. So instead of this kind of uh, um, huge block, uh, we create this kind of porosity between the city and the waterfront. Uh, so we won the competition because uh, they, well, the client liked our thinking, they said. Uh, but after we won, uh, we were, of course, immediately told that Six Towers will not work. Um, so it's going to be too, uh, well, of course, the surface and area ratio is too high and privacy, etc. So we had to immediately study other scheme after we won. Uh, we did uh, a lot of studies, as you can see. But we decided in the end to basically carry the story of the competition 
and, and, and make a new tower out of it. So this was the six towers. We decided to basically uh, reverse mitosis the, uh, the towers to basically put all the kind of slender towers uh, uh, next to each other and uh, make one tower out of it. Uh, we, our first image was this kind of marina tower in Chicago, but as you might know, the original or some of the original scheme they had was this kind of uh, uh, merged two cylinders, so we thought it was kind of interesting. Also, uh, almost by combining those different uh, uh, tubes, uh, it creates this kind of, uh, uh, almost like a Florida Keys, almost like a landscape kind of uh, shape, more organic shapes. This was also our inspiration. So you can see that uh, because there are two cores, so we kept two cores in each uh, cylinder, so the, everyone gets, uh, the elevator will directly open to your unit. So you, there's some transparency in the center here. And also uh, compared to other towers that are standing there, a little bit more organic. Also it resembles a little bit to this bicycle rack building. There will be Coconut Grove Bank uh, in the plinth. As you can see, these uh, are externalized columns. So all the structures are, again, uh, externalized. So there is no hardly any internal column. So the future flexibility is ensured. Also, it uh, acts as a kind of privacy screens because the density of towers there, sometimes you are very close to uh, your own Tower one and two, but also other uh, developments like Ritz Carlton. So, uh, and the columns are kind of undulating. Of course, this is not uh, needed for structural reason, but it's it's a design. Um, so you can see. Um, also, my criticism to the kind of entire development that are happening in the Bay Area is that. Uh, or, or this area is that you have a lim unlimited kind of view to the uh, ocean through a balcony, but it just becomes very generic and it, it lacks the character. So we thought that these columns, columns can actually frame the view and create certain character to your experience. Uh, there's a plinth with a lot of amenities. These are some interiors. Uh, it's actually under construction now. Um, uh, as John Fosso said, it's, uh, we worked on this uh, project, which was very sad. And I think it's a bit strange that the architecture community in Miami or in Miami Beach didn't make a big deal out of this uh, thing. Um, it was a very painful process, as you can imagine, almost, almost like a two-year-long competition. Uh, just, I just explained you very briefly the scheme. It was, as you know, it's a kind of eyesore and also blocking a lot of uh, kind of uh, through connection between the beach side to the uh, inland. So our scheme was almost, and also it's very inefficient because you have two times loading dock, two times entry, two times many things. Uh, our idea was to almost rotate the uh, convention center 90 degrees and create a consolidated parking and loading on the north side and then uh, uh, only f like a major front frontal uh, hall towards the Lincoln Road. And also so that the 18th Street can actually continue so it creates uh, more porosity between the beach side to the uh, other side. So this is coming up to the 18th, so you no longer have a uh, wall of convention center, but you can actually go through. Even the, that whole hall itself could be a public space where you can actually go through, so you don't have this kind of horribly deserted uh, uh, concourse like it is happening now. And we created this kind of series of cultural uh, buildings. So it's a line of kind of culture with uh, Jackie Gleason Theater and maybe 
uh, cultural building, etc., uh, facing 17th Street, creating a kind of cultural cluster with the uh, uh, Frank Gehry's theater. And this is a Pennsylvania Avenue that uh, we used as a kind of main spine to bring people from Lincoln Road into this uh, new district. Um, this was a plan, and the, we thought that the convention center often lacks the, um, the contact to outside, obviously, so we made one gesture that uh, this, this wall actually opens to the botanical garden so that you, ha you have a continuity to the landscape. Uh, this was um, basically a mound here a covering, basically disguising the uh, parking. So that you create a hill to overlook the ocean. Um, competition process was, as you can imagine, was BRK uh, big versus OMA, but also with, against two developers, it became very uh, ugly. A lot of press talking about, and the kind of the media strategy also started to become uh, day by day very similar. And this was, uh, in my experience as an architect, for the first time making a section in the book called Imitation and how argued how Biake actually copied our uh, project. Don't get me wrong, Biake is a very good friend of mine, uh, but I'm just saying the competition setup itself was so uh, crude that, uh, of course, we had to present in the same room and we get the same uh, feedback. So obviously, if you are smart, you basically absorb the feedback, and day by day, the project, two projects became uh, similar. So this was a kind of book all talking only about the similarities, which is, of course, not a nice thing to do, but uh, we, we had to do it. Uh, although we had we went through an elaborate public process, uh, as you can as you know, it was in the end all about uh, a commissioner's vote. So this was our assumption. Uh, we we had the kind of two unknowns, and it was almost like a kind of a very I don't know uh, retarded drama. Those commissioners kind of poking each other. This happened, this doesn't happen in Miami, right? Miami Beach, I guess. And as you might remember, he started to basically criticize our team by saying aggressive and thieves. We were, we couldn't be there, so we were watching with the beer, uh, the live cast of that uh, kind of whole drama. But we won, luckily. This was the moment we won. Obviously, it was not really much to do with the scheme, but it was kind of politics, I guess. So we had celebration. Uh, but as you know, it was kind of mysteriously canceled uh, like two months after we won. So um, the kind of almost two and a half year of competition process, so many uh, uh, efforts and so on uh, now is um, in vain. And this is a scheme that is going to be. No comments about the design, but um, it's a bit... It's a big missed opportunity, obviously. It was not about uh, rebumping the uh, convention center, but rethinking the city center as a, as a urbanism, but now just became uh, just kind of clad, new cladding, new facade job for the convention center. Uh, what time is it? 
15 minutes? Okay. 10 minutes. So I will skip this. Um, I think this um, public space part is interesting. And then I will end with the food research that I'm doing. Um, uh, maybe it's also very relevant in Miami now that uh, about the water uh, sea level rise. But this was this is a project we are doing for the city of Hoboken in New Jersey. Uh, it was uh, a long competition organized by uh, HUD and uh, for the post uh, Sandy uh, disaster. Uh, well, in short, we won together with, again, Biarque, and we are doing a kind of comprehensive master plan for the resiliency of the entire city of Hoboken. Hoboken actually used to be uh, an island. That's how the water actually came and stayed, so it was almost like a kind of became an island. Uh, what's the problem is that the, the, the insurance of the um, the flood insurance is so high that people can't sustain living there anymore. So basically, we are making the entire city uh, resilient to the uh, water. For example, of course, the first thing we have to do is to design the edge uh, with public space. So it's, it's, of course, it doesn't look like a kind of wall, a flood wall, but all these public space are contributing designed to resist the water uh, and the sea level rise, but also uh, public space. And I guess that kind of thinking starts to, uh, well, Miami also need to think of uh, some kind of strategy for the water. Um, public space design is becoming quite uh, a hot topic nowadays, uh, of course, due to uh, uh, success of Highline, for example. So a lot of, of course, the point of Highline was that uh, it was a reappropriation of existing infrastructure, but now everyone is building a new Highline. Uh, so, uh, so we are too. Uh, we won the competition to do a bridge park in Washington D.C. It was connecting two different uh, uh, area. One is low-income area, Anacostia, and the D.C. proper side. Typical bridge is, of course, uh, have a minimum, well, maximum amount of uh, slope uh, that creates a clearance for the uh, ship to pass. But this time, we actually continue the uh, slope so that it creates the X shape that uh, uh, is basically a vertical uh, um, representation of uh, L'Enfant's uh, DC plan. So in the intersection of two uh, uh, elements, there's a um, plaza. So this X actually creates some uh, interesting features. So when you're coming up from one side, it creates a gateway, like a, a entry to the other side. And also, because you can actually continue to go up, you get the view uh, to the uh, DC. Uh, this is to the Anacostia side and also to the DC side, which is, of course, in the bridges, typically very difficult to get. Also, because the, uh, of the X, you can actually have a program underneath So we, we thought it's more, more like a Rialto, but uh, kind of a uh, um, more happier Rialto. Also, structurally, um, it makes sense. Uh, and also creates shades and, again, program space below. When I did this competition, we, we thought that, uh, you know, the architect's somehow domain is being endangered by landscape architects. I think landscape architects has been very smart in improving the urban conditions without relying on uh, building or developers. So obviously they started to win a lot of urban uh, intervention and competitions. And of course the high line, the point was that that's not at all architectural. Uh, and it was very kind of landscape oriented. So. I, th I wanted to win this competition with a very highly architectural uh, bridge uh, or park, in which we lucky won. So this is a water uh, 
filtration system that is uh, uh, integrated to the bridge that we are trying to project the history of Anacostia and so on to the water. Uh, it's a bit flimsy to become a, a monument uh, in Washington, D.C. compared to the other, but we thought the X, of course, uh, is uh, uh, 10, so we could at least make it to the $10 um, bill. That's how we project it. Air Force One. Um, and then I just want to end with the food. Uh, this is a presentation that I gave to Harvard when I had to convince them that the food is an interesting topic to research in relation to architecture and urbanism. Um, the first instinct I had was that uh, w within three fundamental uh, elements of, for human being, clothing, shelter, and food, uh, Fashion and architecture is already yield to globalization, so wherever you go, it's very uh, more or less the same. But food remains to be very global, but at the same time, uh, quite local and diverse. So I thought that's something that the architecture should also uh, learn from. Uh, the food is the biggest industry uh, currently, $15 trillion. And as you know, a lot of architects try to combine the food production and the kind of the city. This is a broad acre city plan by Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, that kind of thing is actually happening in some places, like this is a, uh, in China. Uh, because of the growth of the city, it's of course rapidly increasing, and, but that means more population. That ne needs more agricultural land, but the agricultural land is actually shrinking. So you really have to start thinking about uh, how to combine the food production and the city life. This is an accidental case, but it actually inspires uh, us to rethink the form of the city. Uh, for example, now Singapore, Singaporean government is planning an uh, entire city, new city that is catering the entire population of Singapore to get, together with uh, Chinese government called Super Farm. So it's an entirely new city just to sustain Singapore. Uh, 2011 was the first time that the production of fish uh, exceeded uh, uh, beef. That means the ocean is becoming also the domain for the fruit production more and more. This is the city of Hainan, again, an accidental case of uh, for, uh, fish uh, farmers living on the water. But of course, architects has planned many uh, uh, cities uh, utopian cities on the water, but now that the food production uh, is, is related to a food production, I can easily imagine that uh, that kind of floating city is meaningful. Uh, the food is also rela highly related to mo uh, mobility. This is the first McDonald's store that was a car hopping uh, place. And as you know, supermarket is also invented through the invention of cars where you can actually put your grocery, a weak amount of groceries into your trunk. So um, what's happening now is that it used to be that you still had to drive to uh, get your food. But nowadays it's the reverse. The food is basically coming to you quite often. As you know, the food truck tendency is uh, one of which. It's creating a lot of problems and architects are not really planning uh, on this kind of uh, phenomena. Um, there are $2.3 billion invested in on the new food startups last year, meaning uh, then the most of the startups are delivery service startups. So basically, they deliver chef, they deliver fresh food, they deliver uh, some pre-cooked uh, meal, as you know. Uh, so the food is now the, uh, kind of coming to you rather than you going to the food. Uh, the, for example, Amazon used to deliver uh, books. Uh, Uber now used to or delivers people. Uh, both now delivers fresh food. Um, typology of canteen is also quite interesting because uh, it's a so very socialist model, uh, as you know, but now it's used in the most capitalist environment like the tech campus headquarters. So you, these, of course, as you know, tech campus 
plan the entire layout uh, based around amenities and uh, uh, canteens. Uh, market is also being pushed out of the city and became very superficial, like farmer's market, which is not so sustainable. Uh, but you, if this is the MV, MVRDV's marketplace in Rotterdam, but if you can imagine that the market can actually create a hybrid with the urban program like this, then you can start to imagine a new model of market, real market, uh, coming back into the city. A kitchen is one of the most evolved area in the uh, history of uh, house. Uh, hence, the kitchen became the kind of uh, forefront of the socializing in the house. So the, this kind of kitchen design emerges that can be either be a kitchen or just a table or counter. Um, also, there are all kinds of new product. This is Electrolux. Uh, it's called Global Chef. So it's a hologram or projection screen, a projection system that they say that uh, 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 either a chef or your family member could be projected to tell you the recipe. But the, this is an actual ad that doesn't, this guy doesn't look neither a family member nor chef. Uh, so it's a kind of hybridized kind of Tinder moment. Um, so it's, it's also kind of very funny. Um, also, there's, now there's a, a 3D food printer. A food printer actually exists quite some time that can print sugar and uh, carbs. But now this company can actually make a powder, uh, creates a powder and actually print uh, the food itself in many different flavors and ingredients. It looks very basic and it looks actually quite disgusting still, but we thought actually we could help as an architect to design the food itself. Uh, with this, uh, I don't go into detail, but we are now doing a new food hub, uh, so-called, uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, where it's in West Louisville, where it because of the flooding, it's actually a very low-income neighborhood. Uh, it's a huge site that was uh, sold by the city uh, to the nonprofit organization. And basically, it's a kind of community center uh, based around the theme of food. So all this program is uh, food-related, from market to aggregation to uh, processing to uh, urban farm and so on. It has a public side and a logistical side because it still has to deliver. and create this kind of a building and uh, 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 landscapes, active landscapes with market and food truck plaza and urban farm. And this is a water tank uh, because we use the uh, water, which we're trying to uh, make some kind of food uh, themed um, shape. That's it, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, the architectural profession is full of uh, creative individuals such as yourself that make creativity the standpoint, the center pillar of their, of their career. Yet, it's also full of people who spend 20 years doing the same thing over and over again, CAD managers and such. And I guess my uh, question to you is, to a young architect, what is your advice for cultivating creativity in their career from the start? Mm. Well, as I can only speak, you know, based on my experience, but I immediately went out of my, you know, co you know country and then thought that uh, uh, working in a global environment was um, 
is the only, well, the kind of, uh, how do you say, environment that our generation can do freely. So I think that triggered me to, you know, develop a skill to kind of observe the, the, the changes and um, the differences and so on. And that inspired me to do um, something, um, I wouldn't say new, but something that is quite unique and you become very open to different culture, different thinking, different standards, and then basically be very specific uh, in your design. And you, you don't prescribe anymore what you know, uh, but rather you basically uh, observe and consume uh, the specificity of the givens and then you know, respond to that specificity. For me, that's quite important. Uh, and I think I'm teaching at Harvard, and of course there are a lot of international students, but you American architects, I think, tend to stay a little bit compared to the other uh, con major countries that in your own country. So obviously you work outside US, but you never actually really move there so, uh, so much. So, Maybe as a young architect, you should try other really living in a different culture. Thank Was there any discussion about the um, convention center? I mean, is that the, I mean, I was really surprised that there is no big reaction from the locals. Uh, which was to follow this on on the television and then in the in, on the websites um, but as you explained the whole process was eliminated in less than two months and um, the, the the politicians that came to to power in the city hall of Miami Beach basically um, for whatever reason were against this process and argued that their, that their election was the proof that the public was against what had happened. In fact, there was a lot of unhappiness with the city commission for reasons that you know as well, but I would venture to say that most of them were not related to the issue of the convention center, but related to issues more, more normal, such as police behavior, uh, health, uh, health um, the sanitation of the streets and, and things like that. And then literally when your, uh, the election of your process was in the fall and the first city commission, the mayor says, I propose that we cancel the project and everybody voted for it without five minutes of discussion, without public input. And then what has happened since then is that now they are building the convention center like you uh, showed, which happens to be in fact 100 feet tall really tall, nobody really knows, but 100 feet is really going to be about three times mm -hmm. or two and a half times the height of the convention center as it is. And right now the battle, if I dare say, is the hotel, uh, which is a 300 feet uh, tall uh, building by John Portman, really quite uh, ugly, uh, and which is in between the theater and the city hall which is the first time that a building that height would be in the middle of the street. There, there is a, 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 con, uh, a referendum coming up at the time of the primary elections for presidential uh, elections, and they need 60% of the vote, and they are public campaigns, no. Um, but it's not easy because it is a barrage of, um, of uh, and, and what, uh, what ended up being is the worst process that could have been imagined, which was to split everything into little pieces. And the only thing we know is exactly what you showed. 
there is no plan, there is no master plan, there is no model, there is no nothing, and um, they've used that they've used the process this way, which means that, first of all, I think a lot of architects, a lot of us were surprised how quickly this whole thing came up because with, uh, there was no discussion. And now everybody's very blasé because we don't know anything, nobody knows anything pretty much about what's going on. It's very, uh, very, uh, yeah, what's very I sad, very sad and very indicative process which also has alienated developers some of which were associated with your team who do not want to, to, to work on Miami Beach anymore. And, and, and yet, uh, you are working on for another <laughs> developer, not that far. It's, it's very, in, it's kind of insane, the whole process, yeah, I, I must I, say. What, what, would, what is, uh, I understand the decision of the city not to rely on developers to develop that uh, whole master plan. So I, I understand that part, but what's, uh, upsetting and I think, I mean, I, I'm just saying this as an observer almost, that the us and Biake were portrayed as a kind of head-to-head -head kind of, you know, a lot of press competition. But if, if you really think of it now, it's just us and Biake who doesn't have any pie uh, in the new scheme. The rest of the team members actually got something, which really for me, it's really a complete exploitation of the, the architect's brand, and then in the end, some generic firms or local firms just get the pie, which in the end, fine, but it's, I'm really surprised that it just doesn't, these things, in, in New York, people don't really know it this uh, so well either. It's, it just doesn't make it to the kind of uh, discussion platform, discussion. Which, which I really think it's a problem. And, and actually, man, many of us who were working for this, and we have been ostracized basically since then, pretty much been eliminated from, from boards or, or from the process as being uh, you know, negative. And, and uh, so now anybody who is here and who may be voting in Miami Beach, please look at the referendum carefully, and I hope you support a no vote. <laughs> which would create a major uh, political problems, but would be probably deserved. In it was a kind of irony the other, yeah, at the Art Basel when Faena Complex, part of the Faena Complex opened, and they invited uh, Mr. Levine <laughs> as a kind of speaker of the opening, and you know, I was in front of him, and he was celebrating the whole, well, this is a great urbanism, da 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 da. And then he was the one who killed our project, you know, celebrating our building to be open. It was kind of really, really sad. Sorry that uh, comp the question session became. Yeah. yeah. Um, you. You know, I get often a question why, like, people out of OMA do quite well after they uh, get independent, like, including BRK and other. A lot of OMA, ex OMA people uh, um, are doing well in the industry. Um, I think that's because we don't, again, we don't really prescribe, so we do a lot of research and then we do a lot of discussions and uh, uh, studies internally. And also, there is no like sketch that is coming from ab above. So you, your, your um, um, basically research or the, the uh, study is basically edited by people are in, in charge. So you, you have a very high stake uh, as a designer, as an architect in the firm. And also, it's very high, less hierarchical or not hierarchical at all. So even uh, uh, students working there. And in the history, there are a lot of good students actually uh, uh, designed the final scheme, final concept. So in that early process, we are very flat. So that also triggers a lot of, uh, you know, good competition or good uh, production. Um, and I think we should also, we are also quite aligned by the profession of uh, um, architects, as you know, Rem often also is, says something like this, but that's why we try to cultivate our own interest using the institutions, like this kind of food, which 
doesn't lead to a project uh, immediately, but you basically uh, observe the world and cultivate your interest and create an obsession first and then take an initiative um, uh, in the process. Otherwise, you know, you're, as an architect, you're always just waiting for the commission to come. Um, also, we have this arm called AMO, which is a research arm, uh, doing branding, you know, more fast-paced, non-architectural commissions, and I think that's also very important to create a uh, dichotomy within the office uh, that uh, some portion dealing with a very different speed, because architecture, the speed is quite, as you know, could be very slow. Um, so I think that kind of series of stimulations within the office, uh, we try to keep uh, our own, or, or like a kind of original, to try to be original in that sense. Thank you. Thank you.